so thank you so much for having me. It's, it's an honor to be here today. So this image really summarizes the focus of my work, which is really about this idea um, of taking the world's open information. So, so essentially reaching around the world, scooping up the world's information and using it to try to understand um, our global world from events and narratives to emotions. It's this essentially trying to catalog human society. Um, and so, it, you know, it, it, it's really about this idea of can we essentially, and this is actually a real image, by the way. Uh, this is actually um, uh, an image that was taken. It's a, an acrylic sphere where they project data from all around it. So it essentially looks like a globe floating in space. Um, and this, this really sort of summarizes my work. So it's, it's about this idea of, of especially taking news data from around the world and utilizing um, both statistical and neural techniques to try to understand, try to essentially transform that news data uh, into, into actually information. So essentially to go from these, these big piles of news and especially imagery and video, given the topic of, of this talk, uh, into data that, you know, essentially how do we go from these piles of articles and piles of imagery uh, into something that that, you know, is, is actually, uh, you know, processable. Um, so, uh, so here we, you know, so, so the Genome Project, you know, it, it has many different pieces. So one obviously is uh, text. So at the, at the, the sort of the highest level, GDAL is, is scooping in, the GDAL project is essentially scooping in all this data from around the world. So from a textual standpoint, you can imagine taking things like um, going through each news article and we use statistical and neural techniques to uh, essentially read through a news article and extract out the factual information from that article. So for example, you know, here's an, art, an example of a sentence that uh, gets converted. Uh, so essentially takes that sentence, parses out what it means uh, and converts that to an actual codified representation that can be analyzed. Uh, same thing with narrative. So trying to reach beyond the physical events described in the news towards the narratives that are captured within there. Um, and this allows us to do things like map emotions around the world, um, happiness through the eyes of news media. So not how are people actually happy around the world, uh, but how is the news media casting uh, that? To be able to look at events in real time and actually take events as they're happening across the world and actually capturing those. Um, to look at patterns across the world. Uh, so actually taking uh, billions and billions of news articles and capturing the events that are you know, sort of extracting the patterns out of that. Um, or, and even forecasting the future, looking to the past to understand what might happen in the present. So, you know, so, so essentially that, that broad vision of taking the world's news, using it to catalog events and narratives and emotions and, and even not just tell us what's happening today, but actually forecast the future. That's really the, the focus of the GDL project. And so the GDL project is an open data project, um, actually jointly supported um, actually by uh, Alphabet, Jigsaw, and, and Google Cloud. Um, and it's an open data project that's, that's really about cataloging human society, of trying to reach around the world into the news um, and, and trying to sort of create this, this open live catalog of society. So it all starts with news. And this is actually a map of all the locations that GDL drew news uh, media from or about um, over the last three years. Um, and so, you know, at the highest level, you can imagine the, the GDL project. It's about trying to reach across the planet and, uh, and essentially monitor in real time news media around the world. Um, now, of course, obviously, uh, you know, historically, so much of our work was in English only. And one of the real focuses of GDEL is to reach beyond simply English. Um, so so GDEL today actually machine translates 65 languages um, and processes, um, actually translate everything it monitors in those 65 languages and uses that to catalog, um, to actually process all this, this different content. Um, and that in turn leads to a myriad different data sets. And this is just a small sampling of the data sets. Um, but of particular interest um, is the imagery uh, data sets, what we can actually do with all this imagery uh, that we're capturing around the world. And so you can imagine all this data is pouring in from across the planet. Um, and we're using all these different GCP tools uh, to try to assess uh, that content. And obviously, uh, historically, a lot of that material was textual. That was a, a big focal point was text. Um, but obviously, given the focus of today, talk, uh, we're most simply interested in imagery. So every day, GDEL's monitoring every, every you know, literally every, every minute, essentially, um, GDEL's monitoring all this news content from across the planet, um, uh, print, broadcast, and web. 
Um, and we're going to focus today on web and television. And so it's bringing in, so it's monitoring all this news. So every, you know, every minute it's monitoring news outlets around the world. It's taking all the news coverage in those, are, in those outlets. Um, and it's going through each of those news articles and um, taking the text, translating that, processing that. But then it's also looking for imagery. So since 2016, uh, we take each news article, we go through, we extract out, you know, we get rid of advertisements and all this other imagery and look just at the core imagery that's actually part of the article itself. We do some initial pre-processing, so traditional histogram, um, you know, things like uh, perceptual hashes, um, and then some additional um, very basic filtering to say, you know, is this image uh, large enough? Is this image high enough resolution? Is it bright enough? Um, and does it appear to have enough detail that it is actually worth processing? So um, from that then, uh, we end up with about um, a million or so images a day um, that we, we run through Google's Cloud Vision tool. So we take this news imagery, we run it through uh, Cloud Vision, uh, Google's uh, Vision API, and we produce something we call the Visual Global Knowledge Graph. Um, to date, since 2016, we've processed around 500 million uh, news images from around the world. So essentially what we do is we take a news article, we find the images in that news article that appear to be relevant, um, uh, sorry, that appear to be high enough resolution and processable. Um, and then we run those through Cloud Vision with all of its features enabled. So that's labels, which is objects and activities, OCR, geography. So we ask it if it can estimate the geographic location of the image, uh, facial emotion, uh, we also look inside that image for all of its EXFIF metadata, so any form of metadata that's present in that image, and then also reverse image search. So essentially, uh, you know, reverse, uh, a reverse image search. And what's Im interesting about, about Cloud Vision, so you can imagine that each image, we take each image that we find in the news, uh, we do some pre-processing to determine if that image is relevant or not, uh, or sorry, is, is, um, is, is useful enough, um, is high enough resolution, et cetera. Then we run it through Cloud Vision. And the output of Cloud Vision for each of these images is, you know, all the objects and activities in there, OCR, I think it's 300 plus languages now, um, geography, facial emotion, all the metadata that was present there, and reverse image search. And reverse image search is really interesting. It essentially takes that image, finds other appearances of that image, either in whole or in part across the web, and uh, then takes that image uh, and, and actually looks at how it was captioned elsewhere across the web. So we can see, for example, that a particular image has appeared a um, uh, hundred different times on the web. Um, and so the, and um, here's how it was captioned in each of those previous uh, situations. So that allows us to do really interesting things. For example, we can search for protests that feature climate change. So you can, uh, you can actually literally say, find me all the news imagery uh, that features a protest where people are holding up signs mentioning climate change. Or um, for example, in the news media, um, you know, for example, uh, The Guardian in the UK uh, last year said it was going to stop using polar bears to depict climate change and instead was gonna use imagery of deserts. And so we can actually then ask, we can actually make a graph and say, how often do we see uh, polar bears showing up in the news versus how often do we see deserts showing up in the news? And so we can actually really see these actual shifts from polar bears to deserts. Uh, but verification's a really interesting one. So that reverse image search uh, becomes very powerful in the context of image verification. So let's say that an image comes out today and it says, this is a protest happening right now um, in Iran. Um, and uh, you know, th this happened within the last 10 minutes. Um, well, using the OCR, we can look in the background of that image and say, well, um, you know, this actually isn't Persian in the background. Um, this is actually Egyptian Arabic in the background of this image. So, uh, you know, already simply from the OCR, we can start to question whether this image really is what it claims to be. Uh, but then using the reverse image search, we can actually um, say that, you know, this image, um, you know, the, the, People are claiming that this image is uh, an image from the last 15 minutes. In reality, this image has been found on the web for the last five years. So we can then say this is not a novel image. This is a pre-existing image. But then we can also then say, uh, based on the captioning, so all the times this image has occurred across the web over time, um, traditionally it was captured uh, or, or captioned as Cairo. Um, so combining these features together, we can take an arbitrary image um, that appears in the news media anywhere on earth, and we can tell you that um, you know this. We we can essentially estimate whether this image is likely to depict uh, what it claims to depict simply by looking at these different characteristics. So does the language match the uh, location? That that the image supposedly was taken. Um, 
is this image really a novel image or has it appeared before? And um, where does it appear? Uh, let's see, it's stuck on the slide. Um, let's see, so you're not actually seeing this, uh, hold on, why is this not, uh, let me, uh, new share, hold on, let me just share the full desktop and be done with it. Let's see. Can people see the slide now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that, that was weird. Um, so yeah, so the, the visual knowledge graph then, um, so we can do all these different things. So then we can, uh, so we can, so verification is a really interesting one. Obviously in this era when we're talking about, uh, you know, fake news and, um, you know, all this, this we're, we're essentially really trying to verify and vet information. Um, you know, this ability to do reverse image search is a very, very powerful um, capacity to, you know, again, we can't tell you that this image, you know, hasn't really been uh, modified. Hi, uh, Kevin, can... Sorry to interrupt you again, but it still says visual global knowledge graph, that slide. Uh, I don't yeah, with I... the text, right? Yes, yes. Okay, that... yeah. I'm still on that slide. Okay, fine. Um, and so, um, so, again, this ability to... Um, to, to really understand um, and, and try to verify imagery um, is a very powerful thing we don't think about a lot. Um, so what can we do with this? We can do a lot of interesting things. Um, we can take the news imagery emerging from each country and ask Cloud Vision, um, what percentage of that image would Cloud Vision um, label as violent, for example? Um, and this becomes very interesting because um, what you get out of here is, for example, here in the United States, um, uh, most imagery is, is very sanitized. So for example, when we hear about about a, a war in uh, somewhere on Earth. Like if we hear, for example, about, um, or for example, the, um, you know, the, the terrible tragedy in Lebanon, most of our imagery here, um, you know, we, we did see some. In Lebanon, we saw some of that imagery. But for the most part, we don't actually see imagery um, of uh, destruction, death, tragedy. Um, we tend to see um, a, a much more sanitized view of it versus in other parts of the world, um, there's actually more there, there, there's a more, a truer version um, of society. And that becomes very interesting when we hear about, for example, the refugee crisis here in the US, um, what we see is just imagery of um, politicians talking about it. Or maybe we see an image of a bunch of uh, people lined up um, at a center. We don't typically see a lot of the imagery of, you know, starvation and, you know, people perishing on the journey. And so it's not really humanized to us. Um, and so this is a very powerful way of kind of understanding how humanized uh, things are. And this is actually a very interesting uh, graph. So this is the percentage of news imagery from each country that depicted a human face. So this becomes very interesting uh, because this allows us uh, to understand. So again, here in the US, when we see, for example, um, we read about, um, say, an event like a car crash, for example, um, you will see the actual car crash. Um, in many other parts of the world, uh, if you, uh, for example, a car crash, what you will see then is a local, um, say, the police chief or a politician or so on, standing at a podium describing what happened. Or you'll actually see, um, you'll actually hear the people or, or see the people that were involved. So it, it's, a very, um, it's a very interesting way to kind of understand through imagery how humanized events are around the world. That's something that's really missing. Um, and, and that's something that we've never really been able to catalog at scale is how humanized um, the, the world is. We can also look at facial emotions. So again, Cloud Vision looks, uh, attempts to estimate the emotion of each face it sees. Um, now again, this is, you know, far from perfect. Uh, it can be skewed by things like, for example, sports imagery uh, tends to be uh, very uh, angry imagery, uh, mostly because sports photographers tend to capture that moment of exertion. Um, and so you can see some really interesting trends in here. Um, and again, this ability to look at scale and be able to ask, why do we see the patterns that we do? Um, this is a fascinating uh, uh, image right here. So this is, um, what we did is actually ask it for uh, all the imagery. Now again, it does not do facial recognition. There's no no facial recognition here. Instead, we asked it for images that were captioned as Donald Trump. Um, that's why um, not all these images actually uh, contain his face. And what was so interesting here is on the right, um, you actually see China, the Philippines, um, and you see this, this beautiful dichotomy of Trump and the Pope. And one image, uh, the Pope is smiling and Trump is very um, exhausted. And the Philippines shows the inverse. And this is a very fascinating geopolitical moment. Um, and this ability to say, for example, just find me all the imagery that was captioned. 
um, as Trump. And so we, then we don't even need to actually analyze the imagery. Uh, we can just simply ask for things that are captioned. Uh, but we can do far more powerful things. Um, so we can ask, for example, for flooding imagery. So this, is, uh, this was actually an analysis we were doing uh, with the global development community um, to look at dead reckoning. So let's say we see a news article, um, a bunch of news covers telling us that there's heavy flooding in a particular area. Uh, what we're really interested in is um, you know, so let's say news cover says that the, that a whole area is, is heavily flooded. Um, you know, again, what we need to understand is, is actually the reality. So is flooded mean one inch of water or one foot of water or 10 feet of water? And so one of the things we can do here is we can sift through all the imagery every day and ask Cloud Vision for all the imagery depicting uh, flooding. And that becomes very powerful because we can actually in real time um, actually pull out imagery of flooding and say, um, you know, here's a, a surge of imagery in this area. It's all brand new imagery, never been seen before, showing heavy flooding. Um, and this is actually a broader image looking at uh, da uh, disasters. So this is actually a, a dashboard we created at one point showing global disasters in real time. As new imagery was emerging, it would go on this map showing things that were acro co happening across the world. Um, we can also do really interesting things. So uh, this is actually uh, an example of uh, pollution. So this is actually a global pollution monitor, um, where what we do is we look in the background of every image, and we look in the ground for trash, and we look in the sky for pollution. And so we can actually use this as kind of a real-time pollution monitor. Uh, it's kind of an interesting idea of using news imagery to monitor the environment around the world. Um, and then this is an example of, of using geocoding. So asking the API to um, estimate the geographic location of each image. Um, now, again, it, it only gives us a location if it can precisely identify that image. So only about 1% of imagery has a location. Um, but that allows us to do something like this, to take the news imagery across the world, and regardless of where that image was published, be able to say, what does it actually depict? Um, and see where, so we can actually see some really interesting trends in terms of across the world, what are the locations that are depicted the most? Now, again, this is also skewed by the fact that this is also probably where a lot of training data came from. Um, but again, Again, this ability to really start uh, piercing together the visual narratives of the news each day. Uh, but we can do more powerful things. Um, so this is actually an example of asking, well, if we take all, if we take this 500 million images that we've analyzed, um, how do they cluster together based on visual? So in this case, we're taking the labels, so the objects and activities from each image, and with a single query in, S, in uh, BigQuery, we can actually generate an image like this that actually shows us how those labels co-occur across the world's news imagery. Um, and then we can actually um, start looking more, uh, we can start looking at larger and larger uh, kind of graphs at, um, you know, if we, if we look at all these labels, how do they kind of co-occur? And you can filter this in different ways. So we can ask it, for example, uh, imagery that depicts polar bears, how does that cluster together? We can do really interesting um, at scale visual assessments. Um, now, of course, television is a huge area of interest right now. So we have another, another data set called the Visual Global Entity Graph. Um, this is a collaboration with the Internet Archives Television News Archive to analyze television news um, through cloud video. So this is the evening news here, 2010 to present. Um, this is network news, um, April of 2020 to present. We extract out the labels, the OCR, shot change, and um, ASR speech recognition, and the human captioning. Um, and what we do is we, is, so essentially you can imagine 24 hours a day, we're taking CNN, uh, for example, and uh, uh, we're having uh, cloud video just watch CNN around the clock and annotate everything it sees. So we make that, and all the data I should add here is all this is open data. Those 500 million image annotations, not the images, but the annotations are freely downloadable. And same thing here, um, everything that the machine is annotating uh, from this video, you can download those JSON, the many, many terabytes of JSON. Um, you can analyze them big query, and we also have this interactive search service where you can, um, you know, basically keyword search without, um, you know, uh, without actually having to, to analyze that data. Um, and there's really interesting things here. So, for example, machine, you know, video today, video APIs, um, they annotate at the level of an individual frame. So they go through that video and say, you know, here are these 20 frames depicted a helicopter, for example. Um, and this is actually an interesting example because uh, in traditional content analysis where, um, you know, that, that, you know, I have a, a, a deep background there, 
you know, you pay human analysts to watch television news or any form of, of, of video and annotate what they see. And this is a good example because this is one second um, uh, actually of, a, of actually a commercial in this case, one second of airtime, and it had five different major stories um, in that one second of airtime. So uh, when the machine annotates this, it goes frame by frame. It captures all five stories. When we ask humans to annotate it, um, you know, it's, it's a much more muddy, complex story. Um, and we can do really interesting things to this. We can use the camera changes, the shot changes. Um, this is actually a really interesting thing that Laurent Picard of Google did. Um, he showed a simple example of using cloud video where we look at the shot changes and just take the first frame of each shot change and you come up with a rapid visual summary of, t of a television news broadcast. Um, we're also using the captioning of each and we're using, uh, Google actually has something all called AI Workshop. Um, and it's uh, sem semantic similarity for natural language. We take each line of captioning and we compare how semantically similar it is to the line ahead of it. Um, and that allows us actually to ask, for example, um, uh, so one of the things that we want to be able to do is, is split a news broadcast. So you think about a news broadcast, you know, if it says, here's the state of COVID around the world, there's lots of different shots from all over the world. Uh, what we want to be able to do is um, say that, you know, yes, these, these 20 different uh, sub stories, this is all the macro level story of uh, COVID, for example. And so again, that ability to, um, to analyze, um, to, to be able to segment things. Um, here's some examples. We're looking at bookcases. For example, we asked it, um, you know, we asked uh, uh, the video API um, using another tool called Inference API that Google has. Um, what are the, what are some of the visual narratives that appear more post-COVID than pre-COVID? So one of the very first things that pops out is bookcases um, everywhere today, because again, everyone's shooting from home, um, and so what you see behind everyone on the television all of a sudden is bookcases everywhere. Um, or and so this becomes very interesting. Or we ask it for American flags, or um, you know, the phrase Cisco appears everywhere now on CNN because they're interviewing all their people by Cisco. Um, OCR is really interesting because um, here's an example of, um, you know, just this is actually just 10 years of evening news broadcast. And you have, you know, really poor computer generated text. You have uh, Arabic and, and, and Urdu and other languages showing up on American television news as they're showing excerpts from around the world. You're having kind of worst case scenario of green text on a, on a yellow background with red lines going through it. Um, and, and one of the interesting things, of course, with, with OCR is, you know, the fact that it's motion OCR recovery. So here's a frame um, where we took a video, we split it into individual frames and processed that through still imagery uh, OCR. And you can see that you end up with things like this, where the no more, and the last word, you can't tell what it is, is actually the word cars. And again, video OCR is able to recover that. Um, this is an interesting one of using that OCR. We keyword searched uh, CNN, uh, the on-screen, all the on-screen text using the OCR. Um, for their, their dashboard. So they have a, a COVID-19 dashboard. So this is actually showing, um, this is actually a, a heat map showing the appearances of that and then it fades away during the protests here and comes back. Um, so his ability, for example, to look at that on-screen OCR to ask, uh, you know, how are they presenting, for example, COVID-19 to the American public? Um, we can look, for example, of all the Donald Trump tweets that appear simply by looking at his Twitter hashtag, or sorry, his Twitter uh, username, how often that appears in the on-screen text. Um, we can also do really interesting things. Because we have all this OCR, we can load this in the BigQuery, um, and we can simply use a regular expression and say, find all the appearances of the word doctor followed by someone's name. And then instantly, we can then make a histogram by day of all the doctors being interviewed on television news. Um, we can look at things like OCR and entities per second and actually look at the progress of a broadcast over time. We can do visual similarity. So here's an example of taking uh, the three major evening news networks here and then actually comparing all the, all the labels, the objects and activities and actually comparing that over time and actually seeing how they converge and diverge. And the graph at the bottom, uh, where you see that, that sudden, that, that really that dropout, um, that was actually showing us that there was actually a mislabeling um, at the original data source um, where some evening news broadcasts were misclassified. Um, so again, by using a similarity detection, we can both ask macro level questions, but then also ask if there's issues with the, da with the underlying data itself. Um, we can also then take that, the, the, um, the automatic speech recognition um, and the, the OCR run natural language on it um, and then actually extract out all those entities and actually come up with entity graphs on top of that. 
Um, and we're actually in c collaboration with the MDRC. Um, we're actually doing a huge COVID uh, project. They actually, uh, this is actually supported by Google's uh, COVID, uh, uh, Google Cloud's COVID research program. Um, we're actually um, doing a large program right now. We're going to be annotating CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, and BBC for all of this year. So all of that will be watched by cloud video. And then CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News back 10 years during all the previous pandemics that have occurred. Um, and this, of course, is combined with all that online news imagery and articles. And this is a, a date of, of some of the uh, pandemics in the past that we'll be annotating. Um, one of the ideas of this data set is to allow you to, uh, to look at the visual narratives of disease. So for example, um, right now, COVID-19 here in the US, television news coverage is politicians at podiums talking and you know spreadsheets with uh, numbers versus past pandemics were much more pictures of hospitals and doctors and people being affected. Um, and so again, this ability um, to look, so I know I covered a, a lot of ground very, very quickly, um, but, but if you kind of think about, um, so this is the URL, you can go to the GDAL project. Um, the idea of the GDAL project again is to monitor global media from around the world, um, to extract out obviously text, but then for imagery, um, to look inside of each of those news articles on the web, pull out all that imagery and annotate that through cloud vision so you can actually start to understand the visual narratives of the news, to do things like uh, verify uh, content, um, but then also to extend that to television because you know television news is, is you know, still so critical um, as a source of information and we've never been able to really annotate it at scale. So now we've got you know, this ability to, to use a secure, non-consumptive environment to have cloud video watch all this television news, um, analyze it, and then actually uh, label it second by second or frame by frame what it's seeing uh, on television news, how different issues are being depicted, how climate change is being depicted, and so on. And we can do really, really interesting analyses um, and you know, be able to do at scale things. So both be able to visually search the news. So we actually have an interface. You can visually search the news. Um, you can you know, keyword search the on-screen uh, captioning. You can search for imagery of polar bears or what have you. Um, but then you can also do these macro level analyses. So by taking the data at scale, we can start asking these questions of, you know, who's telling the COVID, um, you know, the COVID story. Uh, you know, we can look at um, how, how visually similar are things over time. We do all these very, very powerful um, analyses. And again, everything you've seen here, this is all open data. You can go to the, the GDAL project, just go to gdalproject.org, go to the blog, um, and you'll see all these different data sets there. Everything's downloadable. Um, you can download the JSON files, you can download uh, summary files, you can access it in BigQuery, you can use our online search. Um, so again, I, I know I've covered a lot of ground really quickly, but, but hopefully that gives you some interesting, uh, some interesting ideas. Yes, uh, thanks, Caleb, for the wonderful presentation. We have a few questions, if you'd like to take those. Yes, great. Great, yeah. So should I read them for you? Or yeah, you I don't actually see them in the okay. uh, chat session. OK, uh, they are actually in the Q&A box, which is separate uh, from the chat session. Let's see, where, uh, oops. I can't. Uh... Ah, here it is. Now I see it. Uh, yeah, so fighting fake news. So again, this idea of, you know, being able to do, for example, visual assessment. So saying, you know, is this, we can't tell you that this image depicts what it says it depicts, but what we can tell you is whether this image is new, uh, whether this image, um, you know, has, has um, you know, been, uh, been seen before, whether it's been captioned and so on. Um, you know, what is the, uh, yeah, so censorship and type of society are really, really interesting. Uh, this is actually one of the areas that we're actually doing a lot of work in right now is trying to actually understand uh, these key questions around, um, you know, uh, so, so again, because we have this imagery at scale, finally, we can start asking these questions of, you know, uh, for example, take something like, um, you know, uh, something that occurs, an event right now, um, what's it being seen? Or like, for example, one of the things we're showing here on, on American television news is that um, television networks are showing death and infection counts from COVID. They're not showing anything about the economic impact that almost never gets displayed on screen. Um, and, you know, so that, so basically the American public, when they turn on television, they're seeing the health, not the economic impact. And that can be very interesting. Um, you know, tech summaries, uh, give me a summary of world events. This is actually something we're, we're very interested in right now. So, um, so one of the questions is, um, you know, can, um, you know, can you use this type of data to generate summaries of world events? That's actually an area that we're working on very, uh, very heavily right now is being able to not just tell you um, global events, but be able to tell you their depictions. So for example, here's an event, here's how it's been covered around the world. Um, and here they showed it mostly in terms of charts and statistics. Here they showed it in terms of, of the human impact. 
Um, so this is a, an area that we're very, very interested in. And again, we're very interested in, in you know, folks like you, like you all, um, you know, the data, all this data is open. So we're really, you know, you can, you know, there, there's so many, you know, you can download all this data today and build your own interfaces um, to this type of data. And we're really excited. And, you know, again, if you, if you create something with, with the GDL data and say, hey, this is actually kind of neat. We'd love to feature that on, on the GDL blog as well. Um, you know, do we use citizen news? Um, so we try to grab anything that is, uh, might be considered news material, something that might inform society. So you will see a lot of things on here. You'll see things like, um, for example, um, you, will, you will see, you know, for example, in Russia, you'll see things like ITAR TAS, um, which is, um, you know, state controlled media in Russia today. Um, we're very, we capture anything that might inform society because if it's state controlled media, uh, that allows us to kind of start to understand, you know, what is the government, what is a given government trying to promote as a narrative. Uh, if it is, um, you know, um, say, a, a partisan media, that can help us understand, you know, where do certain stories come from? Stories oftentimes just pop into the media. Where do those come from? How did those come about? Um, this is a, a huge interest to us. Um, and, um, you know, so, so again, uh, and then uh, is media data discarded? Um, yeah, so we don't actually do a news important. So what we, when we look at, uh, so television, we, we process all that television content. For imagery, uh, the criteria we use to decide whether to process an image or not is very simple. Um, it has to be a large enough pixel size. I think it's, it has to be, I think, 300 by 300 pixels because smaller than that, you don't really get any detail. Um, it has to have sufficient visual contrast. So this is a photograph taken at nighttime and there's almost no visual details, just basically a, you know, a nighttime image with nothing discernible. There's, there's nothing really to get out of that. Um, we use things like the perceptual, like the AD, was it ADP, uh, perceptual hashes to ask, you know, essentially, is there enough visual contrast? Is there detail here such that, you know, something like cloud vision would actually be able to analyze it? Um, that's really the only criteria we use. We don't look at anything other than it appeared inside the article and there's sufficient visual detail that there would be um, something, uh, something interesting there. Um, and then, um, you know, how do you manage um, if you get, you um, uh, if there's a frame, so a split frame. Uh, so for um, television news, that's actually something we're very interested in, a split frame where, for example, you might imagine, a, you know, here in the U.S., a congressional debate where half the screen shows live footage from Congress where all the politicians are debating, and the other half is different um, experts talking about what they expect will happen. Uh, that's actually um, something we're very interested in looking at is, you know, how often is that used where you kind of show live footage and then you have uh, different insets or split frames of people talking about what they're seeing um, you know that's that's a great interest to us uh, because again that what we're trying to understand is how when you turn on the television what are you seeing you know how is it being seen to you um, and then stock imagery so for example how often do we see stock imagery that's actually a really really interesting area we've done some some past work on that um, and that's actually an area that we're very interested in is you know when you when you look at online news coverage how much of that is is just a stock photograph you know a traditional you know stock photograph of of a world leader or uh, an event or a city versus a live. And this is particularly interesting with uh, natural disasters. So let's say there's a flood that occurs somewhere. Um, if it's just happened and there's not enough uh, journalists on scene uh, trying to, uh, you know, to uh, display things, uh, you know, one of the, um, you know, one of the issues with that um, is that, you know, let's say a flood just occurred. Uh, what will oftentimes happen is you'll see this, this imagery come out um, where right now they don't have any, there's no photographers there yet, just happened. So they'll show a stock imagery of the city or they'll show imagery from past floods. So they might show an image from a flood a couple years ago um, and say, you know, here's what it looked like a couple years ago. So again, this is, a very e this is a very powerful way to be able to rapidly filter that and say, this is actually a pre-existing image, for example. So I think that's all the, the questions I see here. I don't, I think I got all the, yeah, I think that's all the questions. Great, thank you so much, Caleb, for your time. It was really, really wonderful. That was really insightful. Uh, again, thanks again for taking the time to do this tech talk and we, we appreciate it very much. Uh, and uh, would you like to also share your social media handles so people can reach out? Yes, uh, I will. Uh, what's the best way of doing that? Um, actually, the website's probably the easiest because um, I don't, I don't uh, really do much in the, the way of social media. I study it, uh, but I don't do as much otherwise. Um, if you, uh, 
uh, yeah, um, this is actually, the website's probably the easiest. It's gdoproject.org, and my email's there. My contact information is there. And I would love anyone, you know, if you have questions or, um, you know, you, you do something interesting with GDOT and you'd like us to share it in the blog, or you have a question or you can't figure something out, definitely reach out to me. Or even if you have ideas of other data sets that might be interesting for us to create, I'd love, uh, you know, love to hear from you. Great. Again, uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for having me.